suggestions on getting close to the white-tailed deer, you have to learn uh, white-tailed psychology and how they communicate. That's the, that's the first lesson. You have to uh, realize that these are not stupid creatures and that they're talking to each other the entire time they're watching you. And if you learn to interpret their language, then you can learn how your, your own body language will uh, send them signals to calm them down or even make them flag. So, for example, uh, it, we're, we'll talk a little bit about whitetail here. Uh, white-tailed deer have damn near the same dialect as wild mustangs out west in the western United States. So, back in the day, there was a, there was a fella. Let me see if I can find, um, find his name real quick so I can let you know his name. Maybe you can look him up. Nicholas Evans. Nicholas Evans uh, wrote a book um, about the language of Mustangs in the Western United States. So in the book, I read this book a long time ago. In the book, the main character of the book is actually colorblind. So he could go out at night and... Uh, he could see, he could basically see at night because he's seeing them black and white. So he sees to tones of gray all the time. And he would go out at night, sit up on a ridge, and he would watch wild mustangs down in the valley. And one night while he was out there watching these horses, uh, a young colt was acting up. And one of the mares ran the colt out of the herd. And he sat there watching. There wasn't nothing that he could do. This is a wild Mustang herd. So this this mare chases the young one out of the herd. Now out west, uh, there's power in numbers. Out in the wild, there's power in numbers, especially with white-tailed deer or de or horses or or whatever. We're talking herbivores, right? They'll run in herds for protection. Now, the, this young colt was acting up and got knocked out of the herd for acting up. And every time he tried to come back into that safe zone where he knew he was protected, that mare would chase him back out again. She was teaching him a lesson. She was basically spanking his ass, saying, if you act up, I'm going to kick your ass outside and the wolves are going to get you. She was scaring him. She didn't actually want him to get hurt, but she needed to teach him how to behave. Now, he... He actually witnessed this out in the wild. So the, that got him into watching these, how these horses are communicating with each other. From there, you could take that horse language, equine language, and apply it to white-tailed deer. It's basically the same body language, the same uh, kind of signs that they give each other to communicate and either express danger or calm or where food is at, and, and all kinds of things. So whenever I'm out there with the whitetail, I'm using that same kind of language interpretation. I'm interpreting what they're saying while I'm sitting there with them. Yeah, yeah, he passed away on a live stream, sadly. That was a sad moment. I even put flowers on his grave that, that spring, throughout that spring. Every once in a while when we was out there streaming from camp, we would get, we would get pick wildflowers and put on that mouse's grave. I do that on my channel. <laughs> I ain't ashamed to say it either. I, I, I took care of that mouse for an entire winter, trying to keep him safe and warm, and he loved it above that fireplace because the heat would rise straight up to his nest. It kept him warm. Even after I would leave, there was radiant heat in that stone wall, of the, the back part of the building's stone wall, so there was radiant heat in there. He had the perfect spot. And, of course, it's all plugged up. You know, that vent at the top where he built his nest was uh, hemlock to uh, kind of cut down the drafting that's in the vent. So he had that hemlock, and then he built his nest, and then I took the cordage out there for him, and he had some uh, burlap cordage that I that he could cut up into fine fibers. He had a he had the condo of a mouse house, he really did, uh, and then he just committed suicide. <laughs> you think you know a fella? We protect the groundhog. We don't go out there killing all the wildlife. We, we're trying to bring them closer and closer to camp.
I want them integrated into my camp and I want them integrated into my videos and integrated into my experiences every time I go out there. I want the wildlife to know that whenever I'm in the woods, they don't need to run away. I, I've been focusing on that since the beginning of my channel. And HB really taught me that. I learned that from that deer. Because he started guiding me through the woods and following him, eventually he led me to the herd. Uh, and then we just sit down with him. That happened. That's how it played out with HB. Uh, I started tracking that buck just to get him on film at first. And uh, he led me to his herd. And that first day that I was tracking him, and I was just walking with HB through the woods with this big eight-point buck through the woods. And he stayed about 20 yards ahead of me at that time. Uh, I was walking with him through the woods. He gets up to the herd, and he laid down in this little this little patch of, uh, it was like, um, it, it was thorns, but it wasn't like blackberry patch. It was, um, I think it was like rose hips or something like that, if I remember right. He laid, he laid down in this little patch, and whenever he laid down, for some reason, it just clicked in my head to just lay down on the ground. The deer laid down, so I I laid flat on the ground. I laid on my belly, and I had the camera sitting in front of me, filming it. And for like a half an hour, we just sat there. And so I was just laying on the ground, pretending I was bedding down with this eight-point buck. And the rest of the deer just started circling around and laying down with us. And that was the very first time that I was inside of the herd where I had deer 360 all around me, and I was laying with the deer. And I couldn't move, because I knew if I moved, it, I would ruin what was happening right there. That, that this herd actually let me inside that circle that we were talking about earlier in the, in the stream. That herbivores out in the wild run in herds for protection. And the idea that they let me inside of that herd was them kind of protecting me from coyotes or whatever was out there. I knew that uh, as long as I was inside their circle, they would warn me if anything was it was anywhere near me. That was an amazing experience, and that was like within my first six months of filming for the channel, which is really what set the tone for let's work with the deer, let's work with the wildlife, let's see uh, how we can have these guys integrated into the series and make them characters in the story. So we started giving them names, you know, HB and Millie and Franklin and uh, I don't even remember what we named the groundhog, which is bad. Uh, but yeah, that, that's how I came to start working with wildlife, more so than being a, a survival expert or a bushcrafter. I wasn't going out there showing off my knife all the time or axe skills or anything like that. It was a whole different type of experience, which is something that I wanted to put out. I think it was what made the channel stand out initially. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we did get to the, we did get to the, you know, the builds and the camps. We built a wiki up. Uh, the first season we built a, a wiki up, uh, which was a nice shelter, and it's still standing today. I still maintain it a little bit. Uh, I actually cured myself of the flu inside that wiki up. I turned the wiki up into a sweat lodge on one of my episodes. I had white sage and a bunch of herbs uh, inside a central fire, and we kept pouring, uh, you know, steam in it. We heated up rocks and turned it, or literally turned it into a sweat lodge with uh, aromatic herbs to help cure the flu. And the next day, I did, I was not sick no more. I still felt it a little bit, but I felt a lot better than I did before I went into that wiki up. And we caught all that on video, too. But that was one of the times where uh, I kind of branched away from uh, traditional uh, camping and went into more uh, pagan and old medicine man type stuff, which I do know a lot about. But I don't bring it up on the channel because it alienates too much of the audience whenever you start start talking about paganism or uh, stuff like that. Uh, there's a lot of Christians out there, and they take offense to it. They don't want they don't want to hear old world stuff. Give the groundhog another name. Otis is a good name for a groundhog, and he's fairly cool. He's very shy. He's very antisocial. He's he's probably the most antisocial wild animal that I have on my channel. I've only captured him maybe three times, and you know, I have got him on uh, trail cam, but that's cheating. You don't take offense to paganism. 
I'm a pagan. So yeah, I'm not a Christian. I don't, I don't follow anything that came out of the Middle East. I don't want nothing to do with the Middle East. That includes my religion. Not, not, not a single soul in my DNA came from the Middle East. I am not associated with that religion at all. Yeah, shake, it'll shake a cold. What would be a great conversation to have? Paganism? My pagan side? Uh, a lot of the stuff in this room is paganism. I got some I got some creepy stuff I hidden away in this room. Uh even even the crystals that we gather up uh and stuff like that has pagan connections. A lot of the tones of my channel have pagan connection. You notice like whenever I I film a video and I edit it, it's really dark contrast, deep woods and the, it looks like a fairy tale forest. Uh that's all that all, it all plays into the same thing. I'm complicated. I don't I and we got part three of the codex coming up where I'm trying to break down the mythology of the channel. Uh yeah. Odinism. Odinists. Pagan spirituality. Uh pagan has had a, a a profound connection with nature. That's what it's all about, really. Paganism, the old religions, like pre Christian religions, uh or pre Middle Eastern let's kill everybody and convert them religions. Uh, was all about nature. It was, and a lot of mythology was based about nature too. Brighten that up a little bit. A lot of mythology uh, is based on nature. Um, a lot of what you what you celebrate, a lot of what Christians celebrate today, is based on pagan ideas. Easter is the spring equinox. Christmas is the winter solstice. Uh, Halloween. All I mean, Jesus Christ. It's it's a thing. It's a thing. Paganism. Uh, permeates every single aspect of your life right down to the days of the week. Uh, they had a profound connection with nature and how their religions were based on what they saw in nature. So uh, whenever they celebrated holidays, um, it was the full moons of the month or it was the equinox or the solstice. Those were the main holidays. So you look at the, the pagan wheel of the year, all of the major holidays, there's four major holidays and then there's uh, sub, sub holidays. It's the equinoxes, uh, the, see, I'm getting confused, All Hallows Eve, Halloween is, is, is primarily a, a Celtic thing, but Halloween originally was, the, was, uh, the world is dying, you know, so, uh, that, that came into the mythology of what Halloween actually, it wasn't trick-or-treating, it was the veil between the worlds is at its thinnest. So you can actually communicate with the dead at that time. It was the, the when nature was dying and going to sleep, it, it created a, a thinning of the veil between this world and the next. Um, the closest one we've had, I think, was Fairy Moves Night. April 1st is a holiday. Fairy Moves Night is when the fairies uh, in Celtic mythology would travel from their winter forts to their summer forts. Christmas is a pagan holiday. Jesus was not born in the wintertime. The only reason that Christians celebrate the birth of Christ in the wintertime was because it was a negotiation with the pagans. I'll show you the, t the same tattoo that I'm going to get on the same exact day. All right? Not painful, just weird. Closer and get my it doesn't feel good, but... <laughs> Guys, I did it. It's a... It's a thing. There it is. We're gonna get that same tattoo on the same day. And that uh, goes into uh, our Tetra storyline and the sword. Seven years apart. So, you know, it's a three and seven thing. You watched it a week ago? Yeah, she's fucking hilarious. So we're going to get that, and that is the same that's on the uh, scabbard of the sword, and also right there on the blade of the sword. And then again, the third time, down here at the base of the sword. So we got all that going on, coming up. We're going we're gonna to get to that, and that goes to our uh, tetra that we found out in the woods, which I legitimately found out in the woods. 
and everybody's seen the tetra rack. I don't know. We got a, a lot of new viewers that haven't actually seen it yet, so we'll bust that out real quick. Ugh. And there's our uh, our golden triangle that plays into this whole storyline. Oh, Murph, that's not all. On the day that I get the tattoo, there's going to be a solar eclipse over North America. On the seven-year anniversary that Kate got her tattoo, I will get the same tattoo, and on that same day, there will be a solar eclipse. Welcome to the Huntsman channel. My channel is complicated. We ain't just camping in the woods. It's complicated. What does the symbol mean? It's power, courage, and wisdom. This symbol means power, courage, and wisdom. Yeah, and we go back to the mythology of the channel. Um, the symbol itself means power, courage, and wisdom. There's going to be a solar eclipse on the day that I get the tattoo, and the original symbol for the channel was was made on the hunter's moon so you got the moon you got the the solar eclipse so you got the sun and the moon and then you got seven and three repeating even before the channel was launched it's complicated complicated complicate it don't you wish we were just camping in the woods fixing bagels you wouldn't have to keep up with all this shit? Wouldn't that be easier if we were just rednecking in the woods? And we didn't have all this uh, pagan symbolism and mythology behind the channel? Uh, so Kate got that tattoo. We found the tetra. We get the sword that has the tetra on it. All this other stuff. All these celestial events going on at the same point in time. And even beyond that, um, we have the channel itself and the name of the channel i mean it's just it's just complicated that's why i put i tried to do the codex uh so the codex is breaking down the entire mythology at least the tetra mythology and i found that on a shed hunt i wasn't expecting to find it it just happened so we threw it into the series as a prop uh and from that um this whole thing started spinning out. And then it's going to spin out again into the Alpha series because we're taking all of this uh, storyline that's happening organically and turning it into a fully interactive open world adventure on a live stream. It's a huge project. That's why I spend so much time in development. It's huge. The Huntsman channel is not a YouTube channel. It's so much more. There is so much happening that I don't put on film or that I don't talk about on live streams that that has everything to do with how we're, with where we're going. And we could just be going out camping. We could just be going out sitting with deer every once in a while. We could be just doing that. But there's so much more to the world. And there are so many other realms to explore. <laughs> 